This begins the third unit of the class. And much like we did in the first unit, we first saw how to build simple linear regression models without much regard to whether they were good or not, whether they satisfied all the assumptions. Uh, and then in this middle last part of the class, we've done that with multiple regression. First, we just fit them without regard to whether we were satisfying all the assumptions. Uh, and now we're going to start thinking about that. So lecture 14 is actually a lot like lecture five, if you remember that one, which had leverage, uh, standardized residuals, deleted residuals, um, influence, things like that. So a lot of it's just kind of updating and extending stuff we already know about. But we will see a couple of things that can happen in multiple regression that can't happen in simple linear regression. And then in 15, we'll go even further into that topic where what are some other things that can go wrong and uh, give you a, a bad model in multiple regression that we didn't have to worry about before. Okay, so let's start by going to uh, leverage. In lecture five, uh, we saw that the leverage values were diagonals of the hat matrix. And so now we're dealing with the hat matrix even more explicitly as X, X transpose, X inverse, X transpose. Uh, and we use the leverage values to kind of see if something is an outlier with respect to the predictive variable. So that's what we're going to do here. Is this an outlier with respect to, well, now more than one predictive variable? And fortunately, uh, we only have to update this a little bit for multiple regression. First, a little proposition. For a multiple regression model that has p predictors plus an intercept, the average leverage value is p plus one over n. So it's the number of predictors, including the intercept. Uh, divided by how many observations there are. This is really easy to prove as long as we borrow a matrix algebra result. If you've got square matrices, then the trace of their product does not matter in which order you multiply them, even if the matrices don't commute. So the trace of A times B is equal to uh, the trace of B times A even if AB is not equal to BA. So that's neat. Even if they don't commute, uh, their trace will still be the same, no matter which order you multiply in. Okay, well, let's use this to think about the trace of H. Trace is the sum of the diagonal entries. So that's where all the leverage values are, right? Yeah, the sum of the leverage values is the trace of H. And using the expression above for the trace or for H. I'm going to think about what I have in parentheses as a first matrix A times a second matrix B. So using the result, I can just move X transpose to the front. And even though the matrices will not be equal, their traces will. Oh, well, that's really nice, isn't it? Because <laughs> now it's X transpose X times its inverse. This is the trace of the identity of the appropriate size. Well, uh, what's the size of this? We get... Um, <laughs> P columns from the predictors plus one more for the intercept. You're just adding up one P plus one times. That pretty much does it. The sum of the leverage values is the trace is P plus one. So then when you average them, it's P plus one over M and you're done. And in fact, in lecture five, didn't we show that in that case, the sum of the leverage values was two? Yeah, and that is actually a special case of this more general result where before we were just using P to the one. All right, so way back before, uh, that meant that the average leverage value was two over n. And then we looked at twice that to kind of set a threshold for things we might be concerned about, check out more. Uh, so now that rule of thumb is going to become two times p plus one over n. We'll find leverage values. If anything's beyond that, uh, that'll be 
the rule of thumb for when to, when to start getting concerned about it. Okay, here's another thing we use leverage for. You remember lecture 10, I showed you an example of a hidden extrapolation? Where we had a variable that, well, let's say, I'll just draw it real quickly here. If I've got two predictors, and let's say these predictors are correlated with each other. So the predictors look like this. Well, if I put a new point right here. It's within the range of X1, within the range of X2, but it's kind of outside what's typical norm for the joint distribution of X1 and X2. So uh, what if we have more than two predictors we can't visualize anymore? Is there a way we can calculate and quantify how much of an outlier something is? We can. We'll take our new observation, put it in a row vector, I'm calling it X nu, and we'll calculate. So there's the row vector. You go back to your original data matrix and you construct X transpose X inverse. And then you put X nu transpose. So check the divisions. This will be square, row vector, square matrix, column vector. That's just gonna be a scalar, right? That's gonna give us back a value that we can compare to the leverage values of the stuff in X in the original data set and determine if these are outliers or not. All right, so on the next page, we'll go into uh, an example question so far. So it looks a lot like the way you construct uh, the H matrix where you would get leverage values, but now on the outsides, you just have row and column instead of uh, larger matrices. Okay, so we'll use the CARS 93 data frame. We'll fit a model that predicts price from four numeric variables, weight, length, horsepower, and miles per gallon, uh, fuel efficiency. We'll plot the leverage values with a dotted line for the conventional threshold. Uh, then we're gonna investigate it by reordering the data frame according to leverage. So in addition to reviewing all of the stuff that we have to update from lecture five, I thought another good use of this lecture would be uh, show you some exploratory data analysis techniques, some ways that we can manipulate the data frame to uncover interesting information. And then we'll consider two new vehicles. Uh, if we were to predict price for these, would it be extrapolated? It's kind of hard to tell just by looking at them, right? Well, we'll, we'll calculate that quantity we just defined and we'll find out. So let's take a look at this. Uh, I, I fit my model. And one of the things I was doing when I was constructing it, I was testing a lot of different models so that I could find something that would give good examples. And I got tired of updating P and N and some of these other things. So I really tried to make it so that I only have to make the changes in the line that makes the fit. And then I can get back the number of predictors and the uh, number of observations, try to get all of that out of the fit object. It just made the whole thing go a whole lot easier. So I, I can get the hat values, the leverage values from a built-in function, but I know that I want to make, uh, I want to look at two new leverage values a little bit later. So that's what these are for. These are placeholders for the new observations. So I just start with them being NA, and then later I can use the points uh, function and actually add those in. So that's why that looks kind of funny. I'm plotting leverage for all the normal stuff, and then saving space for something new. Okay, uh, you can see there I've calculated that threshold, two times P plus one over N, where we start getting concerned about leverage. And so I add that as a horizontal line and I'll make it dotted. All right, now here, that is probably a lot to grab your mind around all at once. So let's break this down a little bit. From here to here, I'm picking out rows of cars 93. But how am I picking out the rows? I take the fit object, get the hat values, so leverage. I'm ordering, basically ordering by leverage, but by default, that'll go from the smallest to the largest. And I'm really concerned about the biggest ones, right? So then I push that into reverse. And then those are the indices that I use for the rows. And then uh, what do I want for my columns? That's what I'm doing here, picking out the columns that I want.
Um, I want to know the name of the vehicle so I can you know, have an identifier for it. But I also wanted to see what are the values for all of the variables I'm including in the model. So I look at the coefficient, just extract the names out and say, show me the weight linked towards power miles per gallon. But I didn't want the intercept. So that negative one is removing the intercept from the coefficients, getting the names on the rest of it. And then that's the columns I want to look at. So the negative one is there to remove the intercept. Do we want to look deeper at this? Do you want me to go into the code and show it piece by piece, or do you kind of believe it and you're all right with it? Okay, yeah, all right, let's keep on going. Then. Okay, so let's look what kind of cars are high leverage. There's Geo Metro, which is a basically a glorified go kart, 55 horsepower. But that's really nice fuel efficiency. <laughs> That'd be good in the current economy, right? Also, the Honda Civic, uh, that's another kind of small, low horsepower, but high fuel efficiency car. So these are kind of on the edges of uh, horsepower and fuel efficiency. Mazda RX-7, uh, that's actually a very high horsepower car. And the next two are both high horsepower. So we can kind of see the high leverage uh, observations. They're kind of the extreme ends. The, the small things that are really fuel efficient, and then things with the big beefy engines that are uh, not fuel efficient. And so to be able to do some comparison, I decided to call the summary function on cars, but just for the variables that are in the, uh, the data frame. I'm sorry, not the data frame, but in the model. Uh, so the minimum weight car is 1695. And notice, that's what this one is. That's not just a small car. It's the smallest car in the data set. Also, it's horsepower of uh, 55. That's the wimpiest car in the, in the data set. <clears throat> Is it the most fuel efficient? If it's got 46, yes. It's either the most fuel efficient or it's tied for it. So I found this to be a, a useful way to Look at my high leverage values, the ones that are the, the highest, and then compare that to these other variables and see, yeah, these are the ones kind of on the edges or boundary of the predictor variable space. Okay, any comments or questions on that? Let's keep on going so we can get done with all this today. So now we need to answer the second question. Are either of those two cars that I define extrapolate? So I call them car one uh, and car two. I put them in here and I'm using R binds so that they will be treated with uh, or as matrices with dimensions. And so remember this trick. I don't actually have to construct X manually. If I call model.matrix on the fifth, it'll give me the data matrix back with the intercept. And notice I am including the intercept. Uh, when I construct row vectors for these two cars. And then here, top of the next page, I'm just using that expression that we wrote down on page one, false. Once for car one, another one time for car two, using the transpose at the end. Okay, and so remember, I had made a plot, but I'd saved two points at the end. So in positions n plus one and n plus two, I'm putting in those new uh, H values for car one and car two. I decided I'd give them a different symbol, that's what PCH does, and give a different color. <clears throat> so let's look at it. All right, so first, all of the black circles, those are the cars in the original data set. Most of them have really low leverage values, they're ordinary cars. There's that uh, two times P plus one over N, threshold. So the cars above that are the ones we're starting to think, yeah, these are uh, kind of on the edges of the data. So like there's the highest one. That one's the Geo Metro. And I think it's the Honda Civic beside that. And then here are the last two cars that I put in that weren't in the data. But there's car one and there's car two. Two. So the first car, if we predicted a price for that, would, it be, would we be extrapolating? Doesn't seem like it, not at all. 
Good for the second one? Yeah. And that's hard to see just looking at the uh, values of the variables. <coughs> With a plot like this, we can tell it's a fairly unusual car relative to the rest of the data. All right, questions there? All right, let's keep on going. Maybe you can speed it up a little bit. I will say we're not completely done with leverage. There's going to be another case where leverage pops up and can cause some problems for us. Okay, uh, let's go to outliers. Do you remember standardized residuals? It's a way of uh, taking residual but counting for its leverage and inflating its value a little bit. This is the same definition from lecture five, I think. Using R for the standardized residual, you take the ordinary residual E sub I that you divide by MSE one minus HII, the leverage value of that observation with the denominator under a square root. So while leverage gives you outlining us in the X horizontal predictor space direction, uh, we think of this as giving us a way of measuring outline as away from the trend uh, vertically in the response. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do this a similar kind of analysis as before. I'm going to plot the standardized residuals. I'm going to order the data frame according to those. But then, since I'm thinking about my response variable, I'm also going to throw a price and predicted price into the data so I can look at all of that at once. So I set up my plot. And remember, you don't have to calculate this manually unless I ask you to specifically. Uh, use R standard, it's a built in function that'll give you standardized residuals. All right, so we take a look here. Now, for leverage, you're only concerned about things that go up high in the positive direction. You can't have negative leverage. But standardized residuals can be either positive or negative. So we're worried about things that are too high above or too high, too low below. All right, so let's see what, what are some of these. I'm probably pretty concerned about this one. Uh, maybe, maybe this one too? That's kind of low. It's beyond negative two. So what, what are those? I'm doing a similar trick as before, except before I start to look in cars 93, I combine with the predicted price, which are the fit values from the fit object. And then I pick the rows ordered by not just the standardized residuals, but their absolute value. So that way I'm going to see the ones that are both really high and really low. And for the columns, I want the make, everything that I put into the model except for the intercept, but I also want price and predicted price. Okay, so what's that largest uh, standardized residual? It's Mercedes Benz. Based off these variables, you would predict it to cost around 30,000. It actually costs about 62,000. So, Mercedes Benz are nice vehicles, right? I don't know. I've never driven one, but I hear they're nice. Uh, and we also see that the third highest absolute value standardized residual is also Mercedes Benz. Audi, I think those are nice cars. Uh, Lincoln, finally, we get to something American uh, that's kind of a luxury brand. Uh, what about this Dodge? Do you think about a Dodge as being a particularly nice car? Okay. <laughs> This one actually is on the, the lower end. Uh, it, looking at the variables, in particular, probably the horsepower, that's a, the muscle car, you would think it would cost a lot, but it actually doesn't. This one's actually cheaper than expected. So what we're seeing here are, uh, this is the Dodge, then, I actually think it's these two are both uh, Mercedes. So um, this made me think about something. We might be missing an important predictor in the model. We're not really picking up on the luxury status of the cars, right? 
And a lot of times you can get luxury status by looking at the, uh, the, the would you say the make or the brand? Maybe manufacturer. Manufacturer is probably the word I'm looking for. Uh, yeah, this made me think. Maybe I'm not accounting for the price premium that comes with luxury brands. What if we put manufacturer in the bottle? So that's the first categorical predictor. I thought it'd be interesting to put that in. Now let's see if we seem to get a better model fit from that. So fit two. Fit two is the one that has manufacturer added. And if we look at the adjusted R squared going from fit one to fit two, that's a pretty big increase, right? It seems, it seems like we're getting a much improved model, even accounting for the additional predictor uh, by including manufacturer. So another way to think about that is if I look at uh, an ANOVA output, what's the additional sum of squares? What do I get beyond all the other stuff that I add manufacturer in? And uh, look at this, look at the extra sum of squares. Compare that to kind of the magnitude of the other values. That's pretty big. Seems like manufacturers is explaining away a lot. And it also looks like it's a very significant uh, predictor. Now notice, there's a lot of different manufacturers. So we're losing a lot of degrees of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems like, it seems like it's worth it. <laughs> but it sounds like there's more to this, doesn't it? Maybe not. Maybe we're going to find out something bad about including manufacturer that hasn't been captured by this analysis yet. So, dun, dun, dun. All right, that's the section for standardized residuals. Any qu questions, comments there? Okay, so let's move into influence. Remember Cook's distance? The idea with Cook's distance is uh, you remove a variable from the model and you, or not a very observation, you see how much things change as a result of that. Um, so one way of calculating it is to exclude the observation and do some calculations, but that's equivalent to an expression involving leverage and standardized particles. And that's the expression that we'll be using here. Cook's distance for the ith observation is equal to take the standardized residual, square it, divide by p plus one, multiply by its leverage over the complemented leverage. If you have a good memory, do you remember what uh, this expression looked like for simple linear regression? For what this was? Well, I'm guessing it's going to be a two. Yeah. It's a two. Yeah. So this is the more general uh, definition. We'll say definition, but proposition uh, for Cook's distance. And yeah, before we were just looking at the special case with the one. That's why we had uh, the two down there. All right. So I'm going to repeat the same kind of thing. I want to plot Cook's distance. I want to order my data sets according to it and see what are the most influential observations. So there I plot. I look at it and uh, man, those two look like a problem, right? Like we got some super high consistent values. Is like something? I said I was going to be quiet there. Ask your questions. Why, why do they all look like doubled up like that? The little floating Venn diagram. Like a lot of the points are like, they have twins. Uh, that's true. It doesn't seem like there's a lot. I got to guess. Okay. I, I got to guess. Um, come back to that in a little bit. And if we don't get that answer today, then I'm curious enough to dive deeper into it. You always going to slow you down if I say <laughs> Okay, so let's see what I'm doing here. I'm uh, combining cars with the predicted price. I get the rows based off of Cook's distance using the built-in function, get my columns. All right, these are new cars. We're not actually seeing any of the high leverage 
or the high standardized residual cars in here, are we? No, they're something else. Does anything about this table strike you as strange? Do we actually have perfect predictions for all of these vehicles? Probably not. <laughs> That's a, that seems like a problem. So for now, let's circle that and maybe just put a WTF by it. Something's going on there. Uh, one other thing, when you look at these brands, Suzuki, Saturn, Saab, Plymouth, Infinity, Ryelser. <clears throat> I've used this data set for years. It wasn't until making this lecture I realized there is a misspelling in the data set. You've been using it for years. Well, you and should contact the authors right away. <laughs> I almost wonder if they put this in here on purpose as a like an exercise, like a, a data cleaning thing. Can you find the uh, mistakes in it? It's an Easter egg. Um, that's actually important that there's a misspelling there. Uh, we'll find that out very, very soon. Are these the common car brands? No, I didn't even know the Suzuki. I thought they made motorcycles. They're one of a kind. There's only one One of a kind. Maybe there are. Maybe these are the cars where that's the only example of something from the manufacturer. Let's see if. There are some, there are more infinities, but does this data set have other uh, vehicles from the infinity brand? All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. It's actually the transformation section where this is all gonna come crashing down. Like there is something wrong with this model and we're gonna figure out what it is uh, when we try to perform a transformation. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna suggest when you, are doing transformations for multiple regression, probably follow the same procedure that I suggested in simple. Try transformations on the response first, as that can help with heteroscedasticity normality very directly. And then look at transformations on the predictors try to improve linearity. So let's start by checking out the residuals. Let's see if it seems like a transformation would help. So re notice right now, I'm looking at the first fit the one that does not have manufacturer. No manufacturer in fit. All right, so what do we think when we see that? It looks like it's increasing as it goes to the right. It looks like it's flaring out, makes me suspect heteroscedasticity. Um, it's not the worst QQ pod I've ever seen. It's not the best either. I definitely got the res uh, large residual over there. Just like to see the flaring out, we do see a slightly increasing trend in this. And uh, this one doesn't have. I think is extreme of yeah, Cook's distance as when manufacturer is included. And there's a reason for that. Uh, maybe that was a little worrisome. But it looks like it's worth trying to improve this one some. All right, so uh, another thing that I like to do when I'm analyzing this is I like to look at a density plot of the residuals. This one's probably row 59. That's the one that popped up in the uh, plot of the summary. So let's try a transformation. Let's try to improve this. I uh, remember in your take home for example one, I pointed you towards a formal test for normality of residuals. And it's like they're very not normal, extremely not normal. So I wondered. What happens if I include manufacturer if I go to fit two? This is the same line that I called a minute ago for getting density of residuals, a plot for it, just for a different model. But now it can't do it. It says X contains missing values. Why do we have missing values? There weren't missing values in the data set. 
Well, is there some reason why maybe we can't calculate a standardized residual? Yeah, so I know we wrote this down just a few pages back, but I'll write it down again. Always a good thing to go to if something's not defined. Maybe you divide it by zero. MSC shouldn't, shouldn't be zero, but what if a leverage value is one? Possibility. And what happens if HII is equal to one? All right, so I want to explore this. I want to find out. So you probably see the is not in a function. This will give you trues wherever something is a, a missing value. So let me get those indices. And then let me look at the hat values that correspond to them. Sure enough, for these rows, the top part is telling me indices or rows of the data set. Ever we ended up getting a undefined standardized residual, that's exactly where the leverage values were one. So that is what's happening. Okay, well, why were the leverage values one? Is there a way we could have predicted this or? Well, like the reset a minute ago, it seemed like we were making two good, perfect predictions for the more rare manufacturers. So look at this. If I use the rows where standardized residuals are undefined and I look at the manufacturer, so ignore the one below, which is showing all the different levels, but look at these. Those are a lot of the same manufacturers we saw before, right? Suzuki, Saturn, Saab, Plymouth, Infinity, Chrysler, Miss Feldman. So let me construct a frequency table. I'll call tables on the manufacturer. And BMW, let's see, Saab, Saturn, Suzuki, Infinity. Yeah, just one of those in this data set. And Cryulcer. I had seen this in the past and I'd forgotten about it. And while I've been reviewing the textbooks, I haven't come across one that talks about this issue. But this is something to be concerned about. This is something that can happen with multiple regression, particularly with categorical predictors. Uh, if you have a level of a categorical variable and there's only one observation, well, that, that observation and its coefficient, they get matched up with each other. And so this observation has complete control over the coefficient estimate for that level of the categorical variable. And that makes sense, right? If that's the only estimate, this thing gets total, complete leverage. Uh, highest leverage possible, leverage of one. That's why if we go back, it's a few pages back now. A lot of pages back. Oh, that's too far. I'm lost. Where is it? Over here. Okay. Yeah. Um, these observations get complete control over one of the coefficient estimates. So they're going to influence or, or, or leverage that coefficient estimate so that you get a seemingly perfect prediction. So we really can't trust these predictive prices at all because these observations have complete leverage over a, over a coefficient. <laughs> so a couple things to learn from this. One, if you're collecting data, if at all possible, if you can help it. Too far again. Don't have a categorical variable where some of your levels only have one observation. That pretty much guarantees this is going to happen. We don't have any control over this data set. It's already been given to us. Data is already collected. So should we be using manufacturer? I 
I've decided, I don't think so. I don't think it's worth having this problem. We've got too many predictions that's, that are too good to be true. Uh, I think we're actually ending up with a flawed model by using manufacturer. And I also think we can't really trust that R squared improvement as much as we thought we could at first, right? It seemed like this was doing way better, but because of that leverage problem, it's overfitting a lot of these observations. So uh, I will write it down here. I think it's probably best not to use manufacturer. But for the of this example, I decided I would go ahead and keep using fit too, so that I would use ordinary residuals instead of standardized residuals. I'm not standardizing, you're not dividing by the leverage or one minus the leverage. And so you won't get undefined values. So other than that, does it look more normal if um, we include manufacturer? A little bit of a problem on each side, but it's not as extreme as that one giant problem that we had before. So maybe it's a little better. If we perform, perform the uh, Shapiro Wilco rounding test on this, it's still significant at 0.05, but it's much less significant than before. So it's a relative improvement. But I think I would add to that. Uh, that it looks better. But in a misleading way. We have several observations with leverage being equal to one. And wherever that happens, the ordinary residual is going to be zero. So I think what happened, there was probably a lot of things that were potentially outliers, but they all had their residuals become zero, manufacturers included. So yeah, this looks better, but probably not as much better as it looks. Okay, remember this Box Cox transformation. I, automatic method of trying to uh, find a good transformation on your response variable. Let's try using that. So I call it, and it looks like what it's found is the ideal lambda is really close to zero. Remember what happens if you get a lambda equal to zero? What kind of transformation you get from that? Down here, that's the one that's the natural log. So that's what I used on this. Uh, mutate, I'll call it price log by taking natural log of price. I'll make a new fit and I'll append Boxcox to its name. Same as before, still including manufacturer, even though I probably should not, uh, but using price log as the response. Let's look at the residuals from the transformed fit. That looks a lot better. I don't see those outliers that we had before. And if I do for normality, uh, they're now very consistent with normality. So a flawed model by using manufacturer, all that accounted for, the transformation does improve normality residuals. Okay, well, we're all the way on page 11. Flew through that middle part. I'll point out one other thing. When I do call the automatic plotting on the box Cox fit, this is the one that does include manufacturer. Notice the warning, not plotting observations with leverage one. So even if you're not checking the leverage explicitly, if you ever see that warning, you'll know to go and look, you've probably got some levels of a categorical variable with only one observation. Okay. And then this, this is just to show after that transformation. This all looks much better. I don't see any strong patterns in either of the, my left two plots and the QQ plot lines looking really good.
Okay, we've only got one more topic left. Making really good time. So I will pause for a minute. Questions or comments on, on that process? Is there no way to fix it if you have just one observation? I feel like you could make split it into two observations that average to the original. Like that were really close, just above it and below it or something. It feels like there should be a workaround. I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole because I don't want to lose the time that we've made up. But when I've dealt with this in the past, I've seen people use not an ordinary covariance matrix, but one that's consistent with heteroscedasticity. And I'm trying to remember if these could also deal with high leverage values. Or actually, no, I think I may have it backwards. I think we were trying to use this deal with heteroscedasticity. And in some cases, we couldn't because it ran into the same problem. Okay, so started down a false path there. This is not a solution to that. This is another thing that suffers from this. I don't know. I don't know how to fix that. Uh, there was the idea you gave, and that's it's kind of fiddling with the data a little more than, than is healthy. I'll see if I can look into that. I'll see if there is a, uh, a remedy for it. But as of right now, I'm thinking that's just kind of a, if you have that problem, you get that problem. So don't have that problem. I'm trying, I'm trying not to have it to begin with. It seems natural to model some of them together. Okay, so there's an idea. Um, what if we lump them by like uh, European cars, North American cars, Japanese cars? And so now you're collapsing some of your levels into something that will have more than one. Uh, that might work. That's a good idea. Or you could just do like unusual manufacturers for all the ones that were on, except for Chrysler, because that should just be respelled. I guess I was going to say more of a nearest neighbor thing, like find some reasons to lump things together. Yeah, there, there should be a reason for it, if at all possible. Well, just as a, um, a real life example, I've talked about the project I'm doing with the psychologist. One of the demographics he's collecting is uh, race. Another one is sexual orientation. And there are, I don't remember exactly, but several different options for sexual orientation. Uh, straight, gay, bisexual, uh, something doesn't fit into any of the others. And you can imagine most people are choosing straight, and then there's very few observations of the others. So what he did was he just called it, there's a straight and a not straight category, and that's it. Even the same thing with race. Uh, he had a lot of white and a lot of black, and then much fewer Asians, Native Americans, and other categories. I think for that one, he ended up going with uh, white and non-white. So that's common. That's, that's something that the researchers definitely do. I'm not do. worried he's going to hurt somebody's feelings. <laughs> Well, statistical uh, considerations first, I suppose. It's good questions. Any others? Ask questions. We got thirty minutes left and only one topic. You can ask one more. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, last topic is a, a partial regression plot. I just did some examples transforming the response. In box plot, box cox transformation is that pretty easy. Transforming the predictors, this is harder because now there's a lot of them. And it can be kind of hard to transform one without changing relationships with the others. So um, what do you do? We're going to introduce the variables in the model one at a time, and we'll use a new kind of visualization called a partial regression or added variable plot uh, to try to account for what's already in the model. All right, so let's define it. Let's read it here in the paragraph, and then I'll write a couple of three-step instruction process. A partial regression plot, it plots the portion of the response and candidate predictor, one you're about to add into the model, uh, 
but you want to look at only the portions not explained by linear relationships with things that are already in the model, uh, already accounted for with existing predictors. So let's suppose that we've already included X1 as a predictor, and then we're trying to figure out what transformation we should put on X2 to put it into the model. So step one, if you've already included X1 in the model, then you regress your response on X1 and then save your residuals. And specifically, I'm gonna write these as residuals of Y having been regressed on X1. Now we're gonna do something that feels unusual, but we're gonna regress one of our predictors on another one. We're thinking about putting X2 in the model, well, we kind of want to know what's the information in X2 that hasn't already been uh, captured by X1. So I'm going to regress X2 on X1. So I'll have residuals from this model. These I'll call the residuals of X2 regressed on X1. So then finally, I'm going to plot Residuals of Y on X1 on the vertical axis and residuals X2 on X1 on the horizontal axis. And this plot should give me some information on how to include X2 in the model but haven't already accounted for X1. All right, so that seemed like a sensible thing to do. Try to find out what is there and why that X1 hasn't explained yet. What is there in X2 that hasn't captured by X1 yet? What kind of relationship is there between those? Let's see, a couple people still writing. All right, looks like they're mostly done. Sometimes you'll make this plot and it'll be flat with no trim. That tells you it's probably not worth including X2 in the model. It's not giving much additional information about why. If you get a linear trend, that's kind of what you would hope for. You can just throw X2 into the model directly. If the plot shows a trend, but it's not linear, it's curved, then that the shape of that trend or curve will give information about what transformation to put on X2 to put it into the model next. All right, so for this one, uh, I had a hard time finding a real data set that was good for this. So I don't like this, but I'm doing it more and more at the end of the class when we have really specialized applications. I, I invented some, some data. So actually, I know the exact conditional or true relationship between the Y and the Xs. Uh, but let's not go into it knowing that. Let's just import the data, try to work through it. Let's see if we can figure out together what kind of transformations should we make? And we'll use the partial regression plots to help us do that. All right, so I think I'm starting right here. I'll start with a plot. This data set has a Y and X1 and X2. And actually, if you look at this, does it look like it would be even worth doing linear regression model? Look at relationships between X1 and Y and X2 and Y. Maybe there's something there. Doesn't seem like there's much here. Doesn't seem like there's any correlation between the predictors. Or not much. So I, in the past, before I had learned more regression, I would have looked at this and been like, don't even try it. No, no point in even trying here. This is the one you made yourself. Mm -hmm. Why did you make something so gross? To make it an interesting example. And I think we'll find it actually, it'll come out kind of nice. All right, so let me start with uh, fitting this Y against X1 and X2, no transformations, so that I can call the box box and try to find out 
is there transformation on Y that'll make things look kind of normal? First, do they look normal at all? Uh, there's not too much to learn from this. Maybe just notice it looks like X2 is very significant, but X1 is not, not yet anyway. And yeah, let's look at the, the plot output. Definitely some uh, trend there in the residuals. Ooh, that's bad. Don't like that. I think it's the first time I've seen one that looks like this. It's down and comes up. All right, so. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty unusual. Seems like a terrible, terrible fit, but let's transform it. So I'll call box cox on that to get back my box cox object. Okay, it looks like the best lambda is somewhat close to zero, but it's not within the confidence uh, bounds. What lambda do we actually get back from that? Oh, I can just barely see it in my environment. About 0.1. So I would think of this as like a, like a tenth root. Let's try thinking of around a tenth root of this. So I'm going to add a new variable in the data frame, y sub bc for box comp. And it'll be that transformation. We, we looked at that back in, I don't know, it was lecture six, somewhere around there. All right, so let me look at this plot. And we're not using Y right now. So ignore this left column and this top row. And let's look in here. If I look at Y and X1, better than it was before. There's at least some kind of relationship here. And actually, the relationship with, with the transform Y and X2, it's actually looking pretty good. So already, I'm feeling more optimistic about being able to do something like this. So why don't I start by... I'll go ahead and put X1 into the model, and then I'll uh, look at a partial regression plot and see what to do to X2 to put it in. All right, so here, now my most current iteration of fit is box cox Y against X1. So let me look at that. Well, it's something. What would you do if you see this? What kind of transformation might give me that kind of shape? There's two that come to mind. Well, a log or a square root, those both have that general shape. Uh, decided to try the log. So I'm making a new variable, x1 log, by taking the log. I'll fit box cox y against log x1. Better. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's definitely better. And actually, maybe it's not as bad as it looks because it's true I don't see as much variance here as I do here, but there's also just not as many observations. That's partially a product of these having higher leverage. So, okay, maybe I'm satisfied with X1. Let's try bringing X2 in. So I want to make a partial regression plot. So now I'm going to make a special fit. This is going to be x2 on x1. It's actually the log of x1. So that's what I'm using. And then I'm going to make a plot where I put on horizontal axis residuals x2 on x1, vertical axis residuals from fit, which are y, transform y on transform x1. All right, so there's my partial regression plot, and man, that looks really good, actually. <laughs> that looks better than X2 on, uh, yeah, marginally X2 on transform Y. The partial one looks even better. Now, is this, would linear be the best thing here? It's got a little bit. It's got a little bit, enough that I think I'll try transforming X2 with, uh, that's squared. 
So let's try that. And so now I'm plotting just the part of my data frame that has my three transform variables. There's y, x1 log, x2 square. And if I look at relationships here, it's looking way better. We've gone from something super noisy to something. It's actually looking pretty good. So let's make this fit. Let's look at the summary. Now, both of my variables are highly significant. Before, we didn't have significance on this one. And if I look at the plot on this, you know, I think the red line makes it look worse than it really is. You can look past the line. Okay, you got two things over here, and you got two or three over here, but middle of it looks, looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. Uh, and again, I think the line is getting too influenced by this. But otherwise, yeah, there's not a consistent increase or decrease. And all right, a couple of things with a little bit high influence, but most of it uh, doesn't. All right, so it seems like the final model might be, is it y to the one tenth is equal to natural log of x1 plus x2 squared plus an error term that's looking pretty normal? Is that really the box? That wasn't just a chunk here, it was like. You're right. Yeah, I should put in the minus something over something. Yeah, it is minus something over something. That's true. That is the, the heart Wikipedia of the transformation. Really I can do what? I can Wikipedia it really fast. But... Yeah, I have it in, uh, I got it in here because I did that earlier. It's minus one over lambda. I'll squeeze it in. Lambda point one. All right, uh, let me pull back the curtain now. Do you want to see how I actually generated the data? Dying. <laughs> <laughs> so X one, um, I get I get these values from a random exponential. X two from random normal, and Y is equal to. Notice everything over here is inside an exponent. You could take the inverse and say natural log of y is log of x1 plus x2 squared. What we did was really close to what the true relationship was. Uh, the only thing that kind of went wrong, so it was perfectly, that box cox was it close enough to zero for us to choose natural log, but that would have given us the true model if we had used that instead. And I kind of wonder. I was kind of getting tired of this example by the time I finished it, but I wonder what if I tried the box Cox at the end with these transformations on X1 and X2, then could it pick up uh, the right transformation on Y a little better? Maybe, kind of curious, but not curious enough to do it. Okay, last thing, uh, if you want to do a added variable or partial regression plot automatically, uh, it's not built into R, but you can use, this is the car library, which is actually companion to applied regression. I'm going to do it with vehicles and use the AD plots, added variable plots. So let's look at this quick example. Let's fit a small model with price versus weight and length. And do you remember, uh, we've kind of seen in the past that it seems like weight is the stronger of the two predictors. If you put the others in first, which would just be length, and then you put in weight, it does look like there's some additional trend information that, that can be captured. But if you put in weight first, and then you try to add in length, there's not much left for length to do.
So I would think if I had already put in leak, I put in weight, and I probably I might transform that some too. Maybe that x squared of weight. Okay, let's finish with uh, one warning about partial regression plots. They only work if the variables you've already put into the model are correctly specified. Because if you put in x1, when you should have put in, I don't know, the exponential of, of x1, then it's going to look like x2 should be transformed in a certain way, when really it shouldn't. It's actually picking up a lack of transformation on x1. So for these to work best, you have to be very careful. Uh, Try to put in each variable with the right transformation. So then you get the right transformation on the subsequent ones. And you guys are still going to get out about 15 minutes early. I can't believe that. Uh, you've got two homework problems. Each has several parts to this. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.